Uh, here's some headlines about the Atlanta hurricane season of 2020. It's devastating. Breaks all time record. Gulf Coast and my state is on the Gulf Coast. It's battered. Well, we didn't have much damage here at all on the Gulf Coast. Um, notice in the Guardian, they're they're easy to pick on, by the way, for finding false statements. Uh, the Guardian here says dozens of people have died this year as Theta becomes 29th major storm. Now. Think about COVID. We're talking about millions of people dying from this disease, but but what does the Guardian do? Dozens of people have died. It's a pretty small number. Okay, next, let's look at the numbers. On the left, you see the Atlantic hurricane season. 2020 is in the blue, and it is above the red average. Now, 1933, you can see the number was much higher. This is the accumulated cyclone energy. So this is this is the best metric because it tells you not only how long the hurricane lived, how fast it was, how devastating it was. So it adds up all that energy. It's the best way to describe uh, a hurricane season. In 1933, there was about 50% more ACE than in 19, than 2020. So 2020 was not the worst year for hurricane energy. Now I'll go to the North Pacific where, where the lots of hurricanes are. It's barely above half of average. Not much happening in the North Indian Ocean. So when you add the total hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, it was below average. You can't make a story out of that, can you? Now, 2020 year was below average in the Northern Hemisphere. And then if you go global, you'll find it was even further below average. So the hurricane season for 2020 was not anything to write home about. In fact, it was a little quieter than usual. Next. So if you look at time series, this is where 2020 ended up in global ACE. It's almost at the bottom. Interestingly, the coolest northern hemisphere year was 1992. That was the year with the most hurricane energy. And that tells you something about hurricanes, that it's not how hot it is. It's do you have a contrast in temperature? And it's that contrast in temperature that creates the energy that wants to solve that uh, gradient in temperature. All right, next. Uh, tornadoes, United States has the most documented uh, uh, tornadoes. And so we keep pretty good tracks of them, track of them. And you see that for the last uh, 67 years, the first half of that period averaged about 56 tornadoes a year, the second half about 34 tornadoes a year. How can you make a story out of that? Well, it's pretty tough, except to say, hmm, it looks like tornadoes are declining. Now, I'm a climatologist and study things for long periods of time. I would not be surprised if tornadoes turned around and went up again. It's just what they do. It's, it's a very nonlinear, chaotic kind of system, especially in totals of these things. So I'm just saying you don't see here an increase, obviously, in tornado production. Next. Uh, droughts and floods, so the flood is the blue. We have uh, no real trend at all. Some months have a lot in the United States, some months have little. And in terms of areas of the United States in drought, if there is any trend in there, it's slightly lessening. In other words, droughts are becoming less uh, over time, at least in the United States. But the high variability is the story there. And it's not that there is any long-term change at all in droughts or floods. Next. Uh, what about high temperatures? These are the record, the number of stations that had record high temperatures by year. And so you see here that if you want to talk about record high temperatures in the United States, you've got to go back to the 1930s. That's where the real story is. In fact, 14 of the top 15 years with the most heat records occurred before 1960. Here again is just simple evidence that indicates the extreme weather, the extreme hot days, uh, the number we're experiencing now is the same as it was 120 years ago. Next. Uh, global drought, we see here, uh, there was kind of a bump there in 1983 that was related to some of the things the El Nino did that year, but overall the trend is flat, that uh, droughts are not increasing globally, uh, as you can see here. Uh, next. Oh, wildfires. If you lived in the United States this past year, especially August and September and October, it was just story after story of the terrible fires out in the West. 
Calif- again, the Guardian, they're always great to attack. California's wildfire hell, how 2020 became the state's worst ever fire season. Hmm, worst ever. I wonder what that means. Does it mean like there's never been a year with more fires than 2020? That's kind of what it means. And other stories there you see about record fires, 4 million acres and so on like that. And see, like you have a video of of that fire. Boy, that's just something that really catches your eyes, and that's what the news really depends on. Okay, next. Well, let's go back about 400 years and look at North America fires. And you can see here the coverage of the fires. They're quite a bit, all the way up to European settlement. And the basic idea here is that Europeans, when they built stuff and had farms, they didn't want their stuff to burn up. So they figured out how to stop fires. Prior to this time, when a fire was started by lightning or Native Americans, it burned and burned and burned till the fall rains came. So places just got burned up like crazy. Europeans didn't like that. So um, they put out fires and got pretty good at it. Not thinking about what they were ultimately doing other than just saving their own stuff. California became state in in 1850. And you can see there that there are some pretty big uh, wildfire extents uh, back in 1850. Okay, next. Uh, This is me on some of my property, uh, a little bit of property in California foothills, the places that burn up all the time. Look at what uh, one of the most thorough studies did there in the top paragraph on the right. The blue, it says pre-European burn area was four and a half to 12 million acres in California per year. That was the average, four and a half to 12 million acres every year. But as I said, once Europeans got in there and they practiced fire suppression, boy, that number went way, way down. That means a lot of stuff that was dry and dead didn't burn up, and so it's laying around, and in fact, after the 2012 to 2015 drought in the Sierra of California, the forests were weakened, the bark beetles came in because the trees did not have the, the proper defense, uh, being in a weakened state, and killed the trees. In fact, in places, 80% of the trees killed, but they were left standing and they dried out because California did not like you to touch any kind of mother nature stuff and so you couldn't take out a dead tree. So now you've got 150 million dead, dead trees in your forests. And like I said, in places it was 80% killed. 2020 took care of a lot of those dead trees. It doesn't take much of a fire in a very dry deadwood forest for something to get going. And so that is the situation they're living with. And even then, even then, the total acreage in California was less than four and a half million acres. It was not the worst ever fire season because it didn't even make it up to the average over the last 10,000 years. Next. And so I showed this cartoon before. If you want to buy, build a house in uh, the foothills of California, you know, you're putting it in the midst of a bunch of matchsticks ready to go. Okay, next. And then globally, uh, everyone's getting into the act now about putting out fires. And so you see that globally, the amount of acreage burned has been falling uh, in the top one year by year. Satellite estimates now show uh, these falling. And uh, then the lower one, decade by decade, uh, indicates the same thing, that the amount of forest fires and wildfires are declining because people are applying fire suppression techniques. It's probably not a good thing because some, especially in California, uh, a lot of those biomes depend on burning every three years. That's, that's, their, that's the way they live and stay healthy is if they burn every three years. And yet uh, that's been not allowed. And so that has really changed the problem out there. Next. Snow, uh, you, someone said about snow is never going to happen again. Well, you know, we have satellites and they look down and see how much snow coverage there is in the, in the uh, northern hemisphere. And uh, it goes up and down year to year. But as you can see, there is no trend at all. It still snows in the Northern Hemisphere, okay? And to about the same amount every year. Next. Um, 
we look at Arctic sea ice, now you gotta kind of turn your brain around. If you look at the upper left picture, today is on the left and 10,000 years ago is on the right. So if you look at past uh, the past few thousand years or from 10,000 years to 3,000 years or so, ice in the Arctic was very low. The coverage was very low, big open expanses of sea ice all the time for thousands of years. And it's only been in the last uh, 1,500 years that you see the concentration of sea ice increasing, peaking at the little ice age, which ended about 170 years ago, about 1850. So the sea ice in the Arctic reached its maximum uh, amount or extent about 175 years ago. Um, and has bounced back since there. Bottom right, it's another picture of the same thing. This shows low values of sea ice on top, uh, high on the bottom, and you see that low values really dominated the period 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. So we're in a coldish period in terms of the Arctic right now. On the bottom left is the last, um, uh, how many years? I believe it's the last, uh, about 40 years, last 40 years. The blue is the Arctic, Northern Hemisphere, and it has declined as we've all been made aware of. The red is the sea ice around the Antarctic. And the sea ice around the Antarctic has shown an increase up to 2014. Then a series of huge storms came that busted up the ice and sent it to lower latitudes where it melted and uh, really dropped it to about 2017 to uh, a, a low amount. And since 2017, it's been struggling back up and if you look very, very carefully at the very last thin uh, red line there, the monthly value, it's above average again back in Antarctica. The, the two basins are very different. Antarctica has no boundary as it goes to the uh, equator, you know, because there's just water as you go toward the equator from Antarctica. So it can grow if it wants to. Arctic sea ice is pretty much confined. I mean, it's, it's in that Arctic basin and it doesn't have much way to go out. It can only go down and back to normal, back down and back to normal. So it's a different kind of metric there. All right, next. Uh, when you look at sea level, sea level depends on how much ice is on land. And if it melts, it fills up the sea and the sea goes up. So if you look at the last 5 million years on the top, uh, for the first uh, two of those million years, about 20, uh, 10 to 25 meters higher than it is today. Then we went into this ice age type of cycle, up and down, up and down, getting the amplitude bigger and bigger and the lowest point lower and lower until the very last one just 20,000 years ago uh, where sea level went way down. If you look at the bottom left, you see that sea level in these past 24,000 years, it was 120 meters lower than what it is now. Florida was twice as big as it is now because of that uh, uh, continental shelf. Then uh, the sea level rose rapidly as the ice age uh, ice uh, uh, melted, especially in the North American continent, and sea level rose rapidly. And I mean rapidly, like uh, you know, uh, five uh, about uh, <laughs> twelve and a half uh, centimeters per decade for eight thousand years. Now. What's it now, two and a half to three centimeters per decade? 8,000 years, it was four or five times that. And you know, world did okay as far as I can tell. Now let's look at the last 10,000 years on the bottom right. On the left, it's the sea level. You gotta look very carefully, but on the left, if you look carefully, you will see that about 8,000 years ago, the sea level was two to three meters higher than it is today. And then it fell as you go to the right down to current day. And if you look very, very carefully at the very right hand bit, you see what's happened in the last 200 years. There's been a little bit turned back up. In other words, for, for most of the sea ice or sea level records we have, the lowest level in the last 10,000 years or 8,000 years was reached about, 170, about 1850, about 1860. And then that's when sea level started to rise again, about 1860. And that's what we'll see in the next slide. So about 1860, it started rising. If you look at the lower left, you see that uh, that's what's happened the last 120 years. There's a pretty uh, rapid rise there about 1920 uh, to 1960. 
1930 to 1960, uh, similar to the rise we've seen in the last four years. Models have tried to reproduce the real sea level, but you can see in the green words there, it says actual model result, and you see just a very minor change in sea level, uh, nothing like what actually happened. And then they do what they call post hoc corrections, which means, you know, golly, my model didn't do too well. What, what can I jimmy in the thing in, in the output? I'm, I'm going to take the output and play with it and see if I can get a better answer. And uh, you see it didn't quite get to what needed to be. Uh, but what it says, if we look at the column there, it tells you that um, uh, two to three meters higher 7,000 years ago, six to nine meters higher 130,000 years ago, 10 to 25 meters higher. Uh, three, 3 million years ago, and that the glaciers in the past 10,000 years reached their highest extent, and therefore the sea level, the lowest level, around 1850. And then sea level started to rise at that point. And then you see the two rates of rise. The first one, we can't blame on humans. That's just mother nature melting ice. And uh, uh, the second one, though, is popular to blame on humans. About 70% of that rise is due to added water from this melting ice and about 25% from uh, the thermal expansion of the upper layer of the ocean. If you look at that top line, that's the last uh, 30, uh, 25 years or so, and um, we see uh, some satellites have gotten into this piece of information. That rises about three centimeters per decade. And the last, uh, if you look at the last five years, there's just not much rise at all. Uh, so uh, we're uh, uh, not seeing that kind of rapid accelerating sea rise that folks have been talking about. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about three centimeters a decade, that's 30 centimeters, a uh, hundred years. Uh, well, so we're talking about this much sea level. I wonder if humanity can handle that if given a hundred years, you know, I suppose they can. In fact, what we worry about here in Alabama on the Gulf Coast is not an inch per decade. It's 20 feet in six hours. And that's what happens when a hurricane comes. And let me tell you, if you're ready for 20 feet of rise in six hours, you can handle 30 centimeters in 100 years. OK, next. Uh, and then uh, most important for human uh, folks is that we see on the left, uh, uh, the wealth we have. And we see that the wealth that is lost to uh, these kind of weather disasters and so on has actually been declining. So we've gotten smarter about how we build things. In the upper right, we've really gotten smarter because here are the climate related deaths from weather type events. It has plummeted. We just know better how to deal with the weather, how to forecast, how to warn people and to build things better. And so uh, we've seen these uh, uh, both uh, both plots on the right show the amount of uh, uh, deaths have been declining. Now, remember what the Guardian said? Dozens, dozens of people have died from these hurricanes. When you look in the past and you see hundreds of thousands of people had died before. All right, next. So progress toward eradicating poverty is... Uh, uh, going to keep going on. And you can't eradicate poverty without energy. And energy today is primarily from carbon. And that's going to continue. Next. So I, I mentioned this before, but uh, it, it's just such a remarkable uh, comment. It's still with me that a uh, very wealthy environmentalist, I mean very wealthy, said the Chinese lifted 400 million people out of poverty by building a coal fire power plant every week. And next. And that was bad. He thought that was bad because uh, um, it put CO2 in the air. Next. But you know, it was viewed as good by those 400 million people and uh, because they're no longer living in that kind of abject poverty. In 2020, China's coal use rose to its highest level in the last five years. And the record cold temperatures, this really hit them <clears throat> this year, these record cold temperatures in parts of China in early 2021 it actually froze up <laughs> some of the windmills. And so their power consumption went, uh, uh, production went way down from those renewable sources, had blackouts, had, had terrible situations because their energy 
any energy that depended upon the renewables was just not going to come through when it really, really got cold and people really, really needed it. 